Good evening, everybody. I'm Heidi Russell, founder of International Women Artists Salon, and it's my honor to be here tonight as host for our Salon Lounge at Dixon Place as well, which is our monthly showcase of amazing women's artistry across the various disciplines. And um, I'm not going to talk too much tonight because we have a show downstairs which runs about exactly the same amount of time as we do, so we don't want to run into our... Uh, cutting us off of our, our, our last feature. Um, so at the end, I'll talk more about what we do. Um, I know we have some uh, new people here tonight, um, new uh, audience members, so we look forward to um, hearing what you think, and some salon members and their guests, as well as our, 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 you know, our future artists. So uh, this is, as I mentioned, a weekly showcase. Oh, did I say weekly? Wow. I'm upping it. I'm upping it. It's coming back next week. Um, a monthly showcase. And uh, it's meant to provide an opportunity for uh, women artists to present uh, works of progress, um, re uh, bring to light uh, old work or whatnot, um, and just get a sampling um, so that you're well. Then follow them. Um, and so in the program here, you'll see a little bit more in their bios and their websites. So please do take these with you, and follow their work and connect with them on their various uh, social media and their websites. And we also honor an historical woman creative uh, because, as we all know, and across all of the various industries, uh, women have not been represented very well um, uh, throughout history. So that's one of our goals, to uh, help bring to light uh, women from the past. And tonight's honoree is Charlotte Lott Reinier. And she was born in 1899 and, and uh, died in 1981. And Lott was a German film director and the foremost pioneer of silhouette animation. And she made more than 40 films over her career, all using her invention. Her best known films are The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, which was produced in 1926, 10 years prior to Disney's first feature length film. And uh, another film that she's well known for is Papagano, I'm not sure if I pronounced it right, but uh, that was um, made in 1935, and it actually features a music by Mozart. And a lot is also noted for devising a predecessor to the first multi-plane camera, and my being a visual art um, photographer, I am uh, very excited to hear that. Uh, so do look her up uh, on Wikipedia and other areas around the internet and learn more about um, Lot and uh, her work. So uh, tonight we're going to, um, the features are a little out of order, so we're going to start with the film as we usually do. And uh, but it's, I had to fit it on you know, double sided so it all, being a visual artist, it looks pretty. So, uh, so it's on the back. Uh, and our film feature artist tonight is Maria Michaels Musa. And uh, she has. Um, produced a film that we're going to see a little a clip of. She's in the, in the process of producing a film called uh, Tarab. They pronounce it right? Tarab. Tarab. Yes. Okay. Um, which is an uh, Alley Artist production. You're going to learn more about um, that production company and, and her work with the film. But Maria is an actor, producer, screenwriter with French, Canadian, and Lebanese American roots. She honed her acting, dancing, and singing skills at Rhode Island College receiving her BFA in dance, film, and TV communications. After performing as a modern dancer in Boston for several years, she moved to New York City to earn an MFA in dance and choreography from the Tisch School at NYU. And after graduating, she's performed with many modern dance, experimental theater, and performance art groups at downtown venues uh, in New York City. As a choreographer, she's developed a signature hybrid style fusing elements of modern flamingo, Indian, African, and Middle Eastern dance. Can't wait to see more of these um, uh, dance productions that you've done. And uh, she and her company have performed around the world. And uh, so this is a, a new project for her um, to um, get out some messages, which you'll learn more about later. I'll let her talk about it. So without further ado, we're going to bring down the house lights. Is everybody seated comfortably? Okay. Oh. 
Mom, please, enough with setting me up on dates. What about family, huh? Grandchildren for me to spoil. Too much work is not good, eh? I have a date. Really? Is he Lebanese? Oh, can't you just be happy that I have a date? Oh, hell, huh? I was remiss. Uh, I think I'm working on a comedic. Uh, uh, I, I was remiss in, in talking a little bit about the film. Uh, so Tarab is an indie uh, dramedy about a Lebanese American woman who risks losing her career as a lawyer and her conservative family's respect by pursuing her secret passion to perform as a belly dancer. And Maria is, a, as I mentioned, the actor, dancer, screener, and executive producer of this film, Tarab. So uh, welcome to the stage to talk a little bit more about it and ask your questions. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching. Um, I guess I'll just start with, does anyone have any questions or comments about anything? Yes. So is this a real experience? Is this your own lived experience? Uh, it's somewhat semi-autobiographical. I wouldn't say it's uh, completely. I'm definitely not a lawyer. Um, I, there was a brief moment in my, um, you know, growing up where I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I, I lost that pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> but I actually have a very close cousin who is a lawyer, so I kind of, it was sort of an amalgamation of um, her, her life, my life, and, you know, a fictional character. So, yeah. Else. We should have done like free belly dance lessons. Yeah. 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 Um, any other any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Yes. About belly dancing. Yeah, about I, I guess um, just curious. What's your next step? Like what? In what, what in the next? In as far as the film? film. Yeah. Yes. I know it's quite. Um, it's, a it's, it's a long process. Yeah. It yeah. it took me at least a year to get to the first draft. Um, just as far as writing the screenplay, and it's still being revised as we speak, and will probably be, continue to be revised right up until you know the shooting of the film. Um, so we, it's fully cast. Uh, we've got our NIFA status, New York Foundation of the Arts, so we're um, nonprofit now. Yay! <laughs> So now we're um, eligible for more grants. So we've begun, you know, really kicking into overdrive, the applying for grants. Um, so that's a, you know, most of you probably know. <laughs> that's, you know, it's, it's exciting, but, you know, daunting. Um, uh, so uh, we have some of the crew. Uh, we're interviewing two really great directors right now who are kind of very, 
excited to be part of the project, they both want to be part of the project, and they're both willing to work for basically no money, which is kind of exciting. <laughs> um, since we don't have any. Right, since we don't have any money yet. yet. Um, so, but they really are excited with the idea and uh, think it has a lot of potential, so. Uh, and we are open to female directors. We did put the call out for female directors. Um, we didn't get a response from any, so if any of you we'll work on that. know any female directors or DPs or, you know, in any position, because we're really trying, it's the other goal of um, Ally Artist Productions and myself personally is to um, have women on both sides of the camera uh, in all different positions. Uh, so there just aren't that many female directors out there. So we have a lot I'm sure they're there, we just need to find them. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the next step is you know, finalizing a director, continuing to apply for grants. Uh, our production, we're set to shoot in early spring. Um, so. And you have a fundraiser going on right now? Um, uh, we, had a, we had a fundraiser a couple weeks ago, but I'm sure we'll have more. Um, so I'm sure there will be many more. Who is the most exciting collaborator you've worked with? Uh, collaboration ones? Yes. Yeah. On any any medium in any medium? Sure. Mm -hmm. Collaboration. Um, I'm going to say uh, I worked with uh, Anahid Safian. She was uh, is uh, also a Salonista, I believe. She was on one of the radio shows. Uh, and she is a Middle Eastern dancer, choreographer, runs her own company, director, uh, and she's just very inspiring. She's been doing it for over 50 years, uh, still performing and, and dancing, you know, amazingly. And uh, so she's sort of a, a role model and uh, inspiration. And I've you know been part of her company and collaborated with her. So. Check her out if, if, if you uh, have a chance. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about where belly dancing sort of fits into the culture that you said your conservative family, mm -hmm. or her conservative family wasn't aligned with? Right. Well, this is another one of the, the reasons I wanted to do the film is sort of educationally, also in addition to entertaining and um, educa ed educating uh, about different aspects of uh, Lebanese culture, Middle Eastern culture. Um, and there is an interesting dichotomy in, in the Arabic culture in general, as far as really loving, you know, belly dance, and you know, people love to dance at social events and hire belly dancers at, for their weddings and other social events. Um, but there is definitely a dichotomy in as far as, you know, it's fine to have that, but to have your daughter be the one who's doing it is a whole other matter. And it would be, uh, and it, depending on how conservative they are, um, it would either be you know slightly scandalous up to you know like very very uh, you know dangerous thing to be doing. Um, uh, my family is Maronite, so we are Maronite Catholic. Um, so. The stigma isn't perhaps as large, but it's, we're still pretty conservative, generally speaking. And you know, they would much rather have a lawyer or a doctor, or, you know, whatever. Um, but it is a very interesting dichotomy of uh, like loving the whole sensual, you know, food and drink and pleasures and dance, and then you know, pulling back from that. So, um, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, the type of dance, is there anything that you've always wanted to tell people to dispel a, a, a myth about belly dancing or, a, or um, just something that you would love people to know about the art of belly dancing? Something I would like them to know. Um, well, basically, I, uh, the other theme of the movie is that, uh, you know, in the West, uh, you know, belly dancing can be seen uh, oftentimes as just 
pure entertainment or just for you know the male viewing or um, and certainly it can be that in certain situations but um, I think my favorite type of event to perform at would be like a wedding and it's uh, it's just a joyous celebration and, and the dancer kind of they do a zephyr which is a, a like a procession with uh, musicians and the dancer leads the bride and groom out into the floor and kind of introduces them to to the audience so the role of the dancers is really important it's, it's sort of a sort of a fertility you know token of good luck and um, those are like the the best events to dance at because um, it really makes sense you know as to why you, know, you have the belly dancer there so I just yeah. Any other questions? Wait, I think? I question. Yeah. Do you see this more as a film about dance mm -hmm. or a film about the family? Right. Yeah. I mean, what? What? what yes. So how question. did you get? How did you start into this? Getting like, into see how it's developing. Right. Um, it started out more as about maybe about the dance and like her personal journey, and then as I started writing, it became more about the whole family and relationships within the family um, and it, it turns out that the father gave up his career as an artist a painter and to go to med school and because that was you know what was expected of him and he would have never you know pursued a professional career as an artist so like it turns out that he kind of has an understanding under there but no one you know no one knew about but about that he kept that from his children, whatever. So, um, yeah, so there were other levels coming in with that. Um, so, yeah, I see it on, it's operating on a few different levels. The dance is, of course, a big part of it, but it, it could almost be anything that she, you know, discovers and finds out about herself. And, Great questions. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, there's great. great. Well, well, we can stay after and, and yeah. talk more. But Thank, you so Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria for this amazing um, piece that you're introducing to the world. I can't wait to see it finished. And uh, our next uh, presentation is going to be um, by um, uh, our newest Solanista, I believe, uh, Donna Cleary. And uh, we've just met tonight after some email uh, connections over this past week. And um, Donna Cleary is a visual artist who engages with sculpture, installation, social practice, and occasionally performance and photography. She runs a project space in her domestic space as a cultural pro platform, providing opportunities for artists and curators alike. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just so happens that a broken wrist led her to photography and exploring the Reclamation of Celtic Healing Practices. So I look forward to learning more about uh, Donna's work. She's got a presentation which will start. Um, and um, she's gonna, I can do that if you want to come on yes. up. She's gonna, she's gonna talk about her work which is around, which she'll point out. Welcome. Yeah. Um, so I am a visual artist and my work is about um, reimagining fetish objects and fertility sculptures. So I'm just going to sort of flash through images of the work that I've been doing for the last year and uh, talk about it as you're looking at it. Um, so this reimagining involves using contemporary materials, um, which are domestic objects that come from the domestic space. And I crochet around them or crochet appendages onto them to create the gendered or generative body. And um, I'm addressing ideas of labor, gender, and desire in a humorous way. Um, and for me, it's a way to sort of access an idea that is really serious. Um, and uh, a lot of the humor comes out in the titles, but it's, um, it's sort of a, side, <laughs> a sideways <laughs> approach. That's called man spread. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So what do I what do am I thinking about when I'm thinking about fetish objects? And there there are four different things under that idea that I'm thinking about. Karl Marx and his critique of the political economy, um, 
in his ideas around um, commodity, commodity fetishism. And that involves um, economic relationships, how we relate to each other um, in terms of bartering or materials, the way we value things, um, or assignment of value um, to various exchanges. And uh, the second thing that I think about is, well, in relating to that is also um, domestic labor and how Carl sort of left out domestic labor in that evaluation and in that critique of capitalism. Um, because it is an unpaid job, um, it doesn't really fit into the schema of capitalism. And my friend Alex actually introduced me to um, an article by Sylvia Federici called uh, Caliban and the Witch. And she theorized um, that that women sort of fit into the capitalistic structure by being left out of the, the, pay, the paying jobs um, as producers of labor for the capitalist system. And so that we always, in an industrial, um, in an industrial economy, we always have a workforce. And uh, so that's you know, tra why traditionally or why it has survived for so long. Um, I'm also thinking about how art fits into the commodification of um, objects and most specifically the contemporary art market right now. Um, and then lastly, the sort of ceremonial past of fetish objects in pre-Abrahamic religions, the pagan religions, where shamans and medical women or medicine women would collect objects from their environment and they would have some sort of value to them. They might be bones from an animal, feathers, um, ashes from a past ceremony, skins from, I don't know, a, an animal that they consumed, and they would bind them together. And then this object would represent um, a way of transcending reality and sort of echoes contemporary psychology. So there was a way of changing the way you perceived things, the way you thought about things. And um, so these are the these are reasons I'm interested in it. And then what do I what am I thinking about when I'm thinking about fertility sculptures? It's along the same idea. Um, Fertility sculptures are a little more specific in the fetish object realm, um, specifically thinking about fertility. So you would have these objects that, you know, think of the Willendorf Venus or the sculpture that they just unearthed in Turkey from 10,000 years ago. Yeah. They would be the generative body. It would be, you know, women with pendulous breasts or a large pregnant abdomen. Um, you know, I think this is this is a place and time where we as women need to be inclusive instead of having our factions and saying, you know, you're over there, you're not doing what I think is important for feminism and you're over there. And, you know, I think for me, the ideal would be that we all recognize and honor and um, come together as, as more than 50% of the population and make sure that certain political people don't come into office and um, you know just really recognize the variety that exists within feminism and embracing all of it and all of the iterations of the feminine and masculine you know and thinking about Jung too that we um, you know when he's talking about animus and anima that we have these male and female parts of us in us and it's normal and you know that that whole spectrum is acceptable as well um, thinking specifically about the some of the objects to um, you know I use yarn that is a reference to my heritage um, I grew up as a family of knitters. My mother, my grandmother, my ancestors are from Ireland. 
Um, they were involved in the wool industry in Ireland and left during the first diaspora when it became illegal to deal with deal in the trade of wool and sheep. And so for me, there's a real personal connection with the yarn. And I have spun a lot of the yarn myself and colored it with um, vegetable dyes as well. Um, a lot of the objects themselves that are not the yarn. Oh, and I've done some photography. And this is like a play on the um, Hudson Valley School of Painting, where they have these bucolic landscapes. And I've gone in and gendered them, given them some testicles. Um, <laughs> but it, it's sort of a commentary to the patriarchal system, too, and the prevalence of, you know, and the need to change that. But also, recognizing at the same time, you know, there's always this duality in my work of, of recognizing and honoring that the men are very much part of the generative process too and the taking over and, and being involved in the domestic space more and more now. Um, and I find that, whoa, what was that? Oh, there it goes. Um, what else? So yeah, there's some really interesting discussions going on now with ar and around these ideas, and it, it gives me hope um, for our future. And you know, as a mother of a young woman, I'm hopeful for all of us. Ooh, gosh, there's so many tall people here tonight. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce um, our literature section. And um, we have a mother-daughter, speaking of, earlier, uh, that's here tonight, Anne Bourne and Mary Baird. And uh, they're going to be doing readings from The Late Orphan Project, which is published by Backpack Press, which is uh, a press by, um, run by Anne Bourne. And um, if you don't mind, I'm not going to read your bios, because I want to have okay. time for the reading. So come on up. Read their bios and, and more on their, their website, but please uh, welcome to the yeah, stage. Thank you. I, I know the bio anyway. This is also the first time we're ever a mother-daughter duo. Oh. This is really fun. Uh, <laughs> this is my daughter, Mary, and I'm the publisher of the Backpack Press. Um, in October of 2015, my father died, and I was surprised at the way I reacted to the to the death and the way it affected me. So as a writer, of course, you always want to know what other people have to say. And I developed what I call the Late Orphan Project. And I solicited writing of all different types from other writers to express how they felt when their parents died. And I told them all explicitly, you're not to tell me how your mother died. I took her to chemo, I took her to the hospital, she got sicker, she got a bad diagnosis, she took a turn for the worse, she died. I don't want that story. It's a very easy story to tell. So I want the story of you. I want to know how you felt. I want to know how it impacted you. I want to know about the day after, the month after. So as it developed, by the middle of February, I had two dozen amazing pieces <coughs> And it became a book called These Winter Months, The Late Orphan Project Anthology. And in the book, which was just published a couple of weeks ago, we have essays and poetry and journal entries from my writers, all 24 of them, who are expressing the story of them. So I'm just curious, before we start to read, um, don't raise your hand, but I'd like to know have your parents died? Have you lost your mother or your father? Because I probably have a book for you. <laughs> There's a tremendous amount of healing in this book, and we're going to share a little bit of it. So this is from the introduction. In trying to relate now what it is like when your parents die, the closest I can come to a faithful description is to lay out a scene from a movie. You are in a boat in the lake. You are the hero. You have a life vest. You feel safe. You're sitting at one end of the boat, and suddenly the boat is hit by a huge wave, and you are thrown overboard, backwards, into the cold, dark water. As you sink, you are oblivious to light, to air, to the speed of your fall, to sound, and that life vest that telegraphed your safety pulls away as you sink motionless, 
suspended. Just a split second before you hit the bottom, your eyes open and you start to kick for all you're worth, seeing light again just over your head, just out of reach. And in one last frantic motion, you find yourself back in the daylight, scrambling for the boat or the life vest or anyone who can save you, anyone who can help you in the next moment as you gasp for air. How long it takes to fall, how long it takes to start kicking, how difficult it is to find that boat again, these are individual stories of grief and pain, even relief, as you write your little craft and set out back to your shore. You're not the same child who climbed into the boat, and as welcoming as the shore may be, it is not anywhere you have ever been. So Mary Dorothy is going to read um, one of the stories. This is Orphan by Sharon Nesbitt Davis. When I was a kid, I loved to read about orphans, Annie, Heidi, and Pollyanna. Orphans were strong and smart and had the power to soften people's hearts. I wrote stories about me being an orphan and saving abandoned dogs and healing a sick child and stopping a war. My mother found them and wrote on the title pages, Sharon, get out of your dream world. It was solid proof she didn't like or understand me. I stopped writing. Decades later, when my brothers and I cleared out our parents' apartment, one of my brothers said, guess we are orphans now. I don't remember who said it, but I remember we laughed. When My Father Died by Jamie Frankie. Before I lost my father, I didn't know he could die. There's a difference between knowing something and knowing it, you know? I didn't believe in my heart of hearts that I could exist in the world without him. But seven years ago, he didn't pick up the phone when I called. When a few hours went by after my voicemail message inviting him to my house the next day to celebrate my 33rd birthday, I knew he was dead. That was when I started to live. Grief Imperfect by Lisa Solod. Six years ago on the day my father died, I also lost my two sisters. Although they did not physically die, they were suddenly and completely lost to me. If the powerful centrifugal force of my father's eight-year illness had pulled us into alignment, with his death, the three of us collided and then spun out of orbit. This is That Day in December by John Haskins. It happens the same way every year. I don't remember the day my mother died until I look at the calendar. I am writing something inside the small square box and see the date is December 30th. It happens the same way every year. It is not a date I remember until I'm making plans for the day, writing on the kitchen calendar, startled for the tiniest second. The day my mother died. I say the words out loud to myself. I was not there when she died. At her insistence, I was not there. I wish I didn't know that, but my brother thought I should know. When mom was dying, I asked her if we should call you. She said no. She actually didn't die that day. She died a couple of weeks later, alone. The doctor from the nursing home called. My brother had inexplicably added me as an emergency contact. I would have been the last person they would have called if they had known how my mother felt about me. In fact, I was the last person they called, just the first to pick up. I had the flu that December and spent days submerged in fever dreams. Maybe it was the fever that made me think the doctor on the phone had a Swedish accent. I pictured him tall and blonde and very kind. It won't be long now. I thanked him. When the Swedish doctor finally tracked down my brother, it was too late. She was gone. In my fever dream, the Swedish doctor stays with her until she takes her last breath. He speaks to her in his thick accent, telling her stories of his childhood as she passes over to the other side. It has been 19 years since she's been gone but it has really been 26. For seven years before her death, she would not speak to me. Hung up the phone if she heard my voice, ignored the pictures I sent of my beautiful baby girl. If you marry him, I will never speak to you again. She was true to her word. I suppose she tore up the pictures the same way I'd seen her tear up other things she wanted nothing to do with. She had thrown out all my dolls, my childhood books, and had given my grandmother's pearl necklace to my brother's wife, my pearl necklace. She erased every trace of me. After she died, my brothers cleaned out her home. They found a few old photographs of me. I am small and I am dancing. A cousin wrote to me after her death. You were her soaring ballerina. And this is how she chose to think of me, if at all. 
a soaring ballerina, a tiny girl frozen in time, a daughter of her own invention. I used to write about my mother to unravel the tangles, to try to separate the woman who barred me from her life and her death from the woman who had warm brownies waiting for me after school. No matter how hard I pulled at the tangles, I ended up with a bigger knot. It happens the same way every year. I'm writing on the kitchen calendar. This year, dinner with my own beloved daughter, the person I love more than anyone in the world. I will think about my mother briefly today, but there will be no answers. And I will pull and I will put the tangled knots and the loose ends away, maybe for good this time. This is the last paragraph of Just Say One Nice Thing by Deb Victoroff. Only a few of my friends have lost a parent, but of course, at this age, it happens more and more frequently. The counsel I offer to those whose parents still live is simple, and I offer it especially when there's been a rift. It applies too for spouses, old friends, siblings. What you must do, I say, is this. Just say one nice thing, one genuine expression of love or kindness or caring or gratitude. One thing that you two can share in perpetuity. Saying only nice things is wonderful. Having a comfortable, fluid, open line of communication is lovely. But who do you know who has that? Between most parents and children, not to mention spouses, not to mention you and your dry cleaner, for heaven's sake, it's just too much to ask. So just say one. And when the inevitable happens, your heartbreak will only be for the, for the loss of a parent and no more. So this is... In essence, the late orphan project. I am incredibly proud of this work. Um, it's been almost exactly a year in production, and I'm reopening the project due to the response that I've gotten, so that starting on November 2nd, if you're ready to write about the death of your parents, you can send them, send pieces to me. I am the publisher of the Backpack Press, and I've passed out invitations to our formal book launch. Y'all are getting a preview. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, beautiful work. And thank you for that last message. It was very poignant for us to take with us. And uh, Anne, did you bring books with you this evening? I have books. Yes. So if anybody would like to purchase, uh, she has them with her. Thank you so much. And you could kind of, kind of get the, the theme of the night uh, about healing and uh, new beginnings and such, right? Uh, and we're going to continue that theme with um, our performance in healing arts feature this evening with Flo and Club. And Flo has been practicing theta healing for 10 years and specializes in empowering professionals step into a meaningful career, improve charisma, and work with intuition. And uh, she teaches this universal modality in addition to her performing career to overcome patterns that challenge us, create perfect health, and manifest the life of our dreams. And she also assists a three-week intuitive anatomy course in New York City. And I'm going to let her speak a little bit more about um, Theta Healing and uh, uh, work with us uh, for the next uh, few minutes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really thankful because it's a great opportunity to mingle with uh, other women artists, which is dear to me. So usually when I get on stage, I know what I'm going to say and I do writing. Uh, but today I'm a little tense because I'm not sure. So do you want to help me relax and take a big breath? <sighs> Together, one more time. <sighs> so just take a mental note of how you feel. Um, so there's two things that fascinate me. Um, it's to train the body as an instrument and also the idea of integrating. Um, so, I've discovered uh, this modality, Theta Healing, um, for a tool for self-improvement for me. And it's only recently uh, that I decided that I should integrate it with the rest of the uh, creative things that I do. So I trained as a singer, as an actor, um, I direct work, but uh, I found that it's a really interesting way to deal with how our mind works. So can someone give me the idea or the definition that they have uh, for the word creation or creativity? Show of hands. <laughs> I don't know, it could be anything. First thing that comes to mind. Passion. Right, passion. Something else? Birth. Birth. 
right? Fun. Fun. Yeah, so basically, the, the, when we are artists, you know, we have to decide what we are going to create. Um, but anyone creates the thoughts, you know, and, and the thing that drives them in their life. So if you're an accountant, if you're having a cranky day, you're creating that. So, so if you are a mathematician and you create a new uh, philosophy, it's like, it, it's your creation. So everyone definitely steps into their life and creates everything. So the work that I do um, is both one-on-one -on -one and then also um, I'm a teacher of it. So if you're interested in like learning how to deal with the things that are blocking you in your manifestation and the thing you'd like to create, um, then it's a very powerful tool. It deals with, like when you have resentment, it's a very, very powerful force and it blocks attracting things that we'd like. Um, then we, like the subconscious is 90% of what's in our mind and consciously 10% of our mind is, is, is working and we have access to it. So it's, it's really about having an open door to our fuller potential and um, and anyone can do it. So maybe we can do a little demonstration. So how many people have their leg crossed? Everybody. <laughs> so you can uncross your legs because the body is an instrument. You know, it's we want to be a clear channel, you know, for things. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and again tune into your breath. Um, and be, just be aware of um, what you're feeling right now. So you want to open your mouth, just relax, like let go of the thoughts that were cl cluttering your day. And you're going to imagine sending the energy into the earth, into the floor, and go all the way into Mother Earth and this really powerful fire. And you can feel one with this energy of creation. So when you tap into this, you're going to come back into your body through your feet, through your legs, and imagine this beautiful light coming up of your body, your pelvis, through your heart, and relax your shoulders, relax your, relax your arms. And imagine sending a beautiful light, a beautiful ball of light on top of your head, above your crown chakra, and continue to ascend with this energy all the way at the top of the ceiling, all the way at the top of the building. And you imagine this light continuing to ascend so far up that you can see all of New York City and you are this light and you continue to ascend past the atmosphere, past the galaxy, you through the planets and you continue to feel far and further and further away. There's a very peaceful feeling and you're very bright. You're this beautiful bright light and you can encounter different winds and different colors and different shapes. Just acknowledge where you are and you're going to direct your energy towards a beautiful pink light, this energy of compassion. And it's gonna feel a little bit like jelly and you're going to go into this substance, this big pink substance that is going to blend with you. And then you're going to feel this infinite bright white. And that is the energy of creativity, of infinite love. So when you're there, you're going to imagine a beautiful like shower of light, shower of water. And you're gonna step back into the life that you currently have and imagine what would be the most amazing things that I, I want to create in my life. So imagine yourself into your life, your current life, with everything you've ever wanted. So where do you live? And who is with you in your life? Just make a mental note of the best possible life you can imagine for yourself.
What is in your bank account in the best of scenarios? Who are the friends in your life? And continue to tap into these things and imagine that they are already present into your life now. Finally, you can ask yourself, what is stopping you from stepping into that? And just see if you get any wisdom there. So now you can come back into your feet, move your hands a little bit, just come back into the room. Still stay connected to your breath. and see how you feel. You don't need to share, but the idea is really to condition your mind and your subconscious to the energy of what you want to attract, that you're compatible with it. I should start and then we'll go backwards since you're just sure, in the sure, middle sure. of this, right? Yes. You're good. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so let's have all the artists come back up, please. And uh, as I close out, and then uh, we'll, we'll open up for more questions and have a group picture. But come on up, uh, Lila. I just um, uh, give her, uh, everybody here uh, another round of applause. Uh, amazing, amazing creativity and passion and inspiration and um, learning and uh, expression and healing. So thank you for sharing your passions and what you've created for us tonight. Can't wait to follow you. And International Women Artists Salon is uh, a platform to connect women creatives around the world so all disciplines, all generations, all backgrounds, all stages of career, all cultures, and uh, all disciplines. So I welcome anybody uh, from anywhere in the world, uh, women who feel a sense of creativity, as uh, Flo mentioned, it's, it's really probably all of us, right? Uh, our, our artists. Um, thank you.